Hey, what's up YouTube? Welcome to this part of the series where we will be covering how to recreate the collapsing sphere effect from my animation nodes teaser video. This is probably one of the coolest projects we've done so far and I can't wait to get started. But first, I would like to give a big shout out to some of those who attempted the challenge from last time, including 3D Escape, Alberto Pinto, Infinex, Optimus, Smig Jigfif, Snake Venom, Mod Prog, and Victor Mikhaev. His gets a special mention today because he took it even further and made this cool collapsing star effect. Without further ado, let's jump into this video. There are many ways to accomplish the same effect as we've just seen in all those examples, but the way I did it was with three objects, a large icosphere, a small icosphere, and a cube. I started off using the same method that I did in the tile flip example, to duplicate the cube on each of the vertices of the outer sphere. Because each list is the same length, and lists of the same length will iterate through at the same time, each iteration of the loop will have an outer sphere vector, an inner sphere vector, and a cube. We can then use the direction between the outer vertex and the inner vertex to get the direction that the cube should face. In order to make the cubes move between the two vectors, we take the distance from the effector to the cube's corresponding vertex of the inner sphere, and we use that to blend between the two corresponding vector points. We use the inner vertex distance instead of the distance from the cube because it remains constant and we can avoid that jittering effect we get when we take the distance from the cube, which is always going to be changing. We can then use the distance from the inner vertex to the cube to interpolate the scale of the cube. And because this is all done in a loop, it's applied to all the cubes in the same way and we have our finished effect. Now let's actually get started in Blender. First, let's add our two icospheres. I'm going to hit Shift A, add in an icosphere and make sure these subdivisions are set to four. Next, I'm going to hit Shift D to duplicate it and then hit Escape, so they're both in the exact same position. I'm going to Edit Mode, and I'm going to scale this down. Now, it is important that you do this in Edit Mode because it will not change the actual scale of the object, which can cause problems in animation nodes. If you did scale in Object Mode, one thing you can do is hit Control A, Apply Scale, and this will achieve the same effect. Next, we are going to name our two icospheres. So go to the Object tab, name the small one, Small Sphere, name the big one, large sphere. And we are also going to go down under display and maximum draw type. We are going to change that to wire for both of our spheres. This way, no matter if we're in solid mode or wireframe mode, they'll both appear as wireframes. This will make it easier to see once we actually start adding the cubes. Speaking of which, I'm going to add our cube now. So shift A, add mesh cube. I'm going to add a small bevel modifier to make it a little bit more visually interesting. The last thing I'm going to add is our empty. So plane axis empty, and I'm going to name this effector. Now let's go into animation nodes. So drag up our timeline, hit shift F3 to tab over to the animation nodes view, add in a new node tree, and add in an object input node. So shift A object input, right click our outer sphere, eye drop our large sphere, and then duplicate that, and eye drop in our cube. First, we need a way to get all the vertices of the outer sphere as a vector list. So in order to do this, I'm going to hit Shift A, go under Mesh, Object Mesh Data, and plug in our object. And now we can get all the vertex locations output as vectors. And we can do this just like we did in the tile flip example with an object instancer, plug the cube into the object instancer, and the vertex locations into the instances. And that will add a get length node, which will create a copy of the cube for every vertex in the list. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to rearrange these nodes a little bit. And now if we select our object instancer, I can hit W, loop through objects, and we have our loop. Rename our first input to cube, and we need to add a new iterator for our vertices. So add in a vector iterator, a vector list, and we are going to name this iterator large sphere vert. And now we can go up to the main body of our program and we can drag our vertex locations into the large sphere vert list. And again, just like in our tile flip example, we can hit Shift A, Object Transform Input, enable the X, Y, and Z location, plug the cube into the object and the large sphere vert into the location. And now all our cubes are moved to each of the vertices, but they're way too big. So let's enable the X, Y, and Z scale as well and set this to something like 0.06. And that looks about right. Now we need all our cubes to face outward. In order to figure out the direction, we are going to subtract the position of the small sphere vector from the large sphere vector. We can then use that to calculate the rotation. So first things first, we need to add our small sphere vertices into the loop as well. 
So I'm going to add a new iterator, a new vector list, and I'm going to name this small sphere vert. And then go up to our main body of our program, duplicate the object input and object mesh data. Go ahead and drag these down to give us a little bit more room. And change the object input of the second one to our small sphere. And plug the vertex locations into the small sphere vert list. I'm sorry, this big M is just driving me crazy. There we go. Now back in our loop body, we can hit Shift A, Vector, Math, change this to Subtract, and plug the large sphere vert into input A, and the small sphere vert into input B. Next, we can hit Control A and search for Direction to Rotation and just plug in our vector math into the direction input and we can leave everything else at default. Now if I enable the X, Y, and Z rotation on the object transform output, I can plug in the direction to rotation into the rotation, and now you can see they're all facing the correct way. Next, we need to interpolate the position between the two spheres. So in order to do this, we're gonna get the distance between the effector and the inner sphere vertex. So we need to bring our effector into the loop. Now we don't need to iterate through vectors because we only have one. So instead, I'm going to add a new parameter to our loop, search for object, and I'm going to rename this effector. Next, I'm going to go up to our main part of our program, duplicate our object input, I drop in our effector, and plug in our object to the effector input. And now we have our effector in our loop. So we need to get the location of the effector. So it's Shift A, Go to Object, Transform Input, and because we only need the location, I'm going to disable the rotation and the scale on the right side of the screen. Plug in our effector, and hit Shift A, Vector, Distance Node. Plug in the effector location to B, plug in the small sphere vert into A, hide that just to make it smaller, and now we need to mix between the two vectors, and thankfully there's a node to do this for us. We can hit Shift A, go to Vector, and add in a Mix Vector node. Plug in the vector distance to the factor. Plug in the large sphere vert into A, the small sphere vert into B. Make sure clamp factor is checked, and plug the result into the location. And now you can see we have sort of the effect we want, except it's the opposite. So we can fix this by using the Map Range node. Just like we did in the other tutorials, hit Shift A, go to Number, Map range, drag that over a bit, plug the vector distance into the value, the value into the factor, and switch the output min to 1 and the output max to 0. And now you can see we're sort of getting what we want, but we have to change a few settings. So the main two settings you're going to want to change are the input min and the input max. The input min is going to be the radius from our effector that our effector affects, and the input max is going to be sort of the sharpness of the fall off. If I drag up the input min, you can see that the radius of our effector is increasing, and if I drag down the input max, you can see it's becoming a sharper fall off. And we can always change this further by checking use interpolation and changing it to something like circular. And now we're kind of getting a cool effect. And I really encourage you to play around with these settings because you can create some really cool things just by tweaking a few numbers. Now, finally, we have to interpolate the scale. And we're going to do this by taking the distance between the cube and the inner sphere. So duplicate our object transform input from before. Plug the cube into the object transform input. Duplicate our vector distance node. Plug in the object transform input to the bottom vector and our small sphere vertex into the upper vector. We are going to need a map range, so at Shift A, go to Number, add in another map range node, plug that into value. Control A, search for Combine Vector. Plug that into all three of the inputs, and plug the vector into Scale. And now you can see this is really big, so what we have to do is we have to change the output min and the output max. So the output max is going to be the size that the cube is on the outer sphere, and the output min is going to be the size that the cube is on the inner sphere. So let's change this output max to 
what it was before, 0 0.06. Maybe a little bigger. There we go, that's about right. And now on the inner sphere, we don't want it to be zero. We want it to still be visible. So drag it up a little bit until it looks about right. And now, if we hide our large sphere and small sphere, you can see we have our finished effect. The final commented and labeled version of this project will be available for download in the link in the description below. I hope you enjoyed this video and a big thanks to all those who support me on Patreon. If you'd like to support these videos as well and see them up to a week before they release on YouTube, you can find the link for that in the description below. Also be sure to like and subscribe and if you have any ideas for future tutorials, make sure to leave those in the comments down below. And I will see you next time. Don't be afraid I'll be the one to guide you through this end.